All right, welcome to another episode of Not Investment Advice. We've got Trunk Fan, me, Master Flex himself. This is Bilal Zaidi, and unfortunately, Jack cannot join us today. He'll be back <laughs> next week. But a very Jack looking person is here to join us. <laughs> Yo, are you saying, man, bro, don't get us canceled, bro. We're going to yeah, demonetize yeah. before we monetize. This is the, uh, the bold version of, of Jack, but we'll, we'll, we'll save the bold discussion for the Oscars in a minute. We'll, we'll get to that in a second. But we yeah, have Alex. Cohen. Cohen today, um, uh, product at Carbon Health. Anything else, Alex? I did a terrible no, well, intro there for you. Will, well, most people will know Alex uh, from Twitter shit posting. Let's just be honest it, here. He's, that's uh, it. That's the it. Chief shit posting officer of Twitter. So one of the <laughs> one of the best Twitter handles out there. But was it another Cohen? Is that your handle? <laughs> An another Cohen. There were so many of us that years ago. I just said, "Oh fuck it, I'll be another Cohen," and here we are. <laughs> <laughs> no, you wait, hold on a second. When you were on, when you were joining Twitter and you're you're picking your handles, were you typing in Cohen and then there's like the drop down came is like you can't like all these have already been taken? Yeah. You know how many Alex Cohen's there are? It is like one of the most <laughs> not uncommon names ever. So I said fuck That's it. Yeah, another Cohen wasn't taken. Have you ever <laughs> done business with another Alex Cohen? Honest question. <laughs> so no, but like two months ago, I went through LinkedIn and I added a bunch of Alex Cohen's as a joke. <laughs> Just <laughs> and so now if you're friends with me on LinkedIn, you'll see me like a bunch of like Alex Cohen, liked Alex Cohen's post. And it's a whole bunch of other Alex Cohen's. And I just that's bumped their hilarious. shit. <laughs> you're, you're up in their bags. So that's hilarious, man. Uh, well, well, you mentioned it, Bilal. We got some bald jokes. Yeah, so it's not bald, but like alopecia which is not something to joke about this is not funny well, people that, 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 that trunk's already getting his take out there but well let's let's get to that so just to let people know what we're talking about we obviously do have to talk about the oscars we don't want to do it to death but we have some stuff to talk about and also the oscars in decline beyond all the Will Smith stuff. We're obviously going to talk about that too. Uh, we're going to do a little bit of the edge of the internet, crypto world stuff on why Bitcoin has been rallying. Uh, du Quan, founder of Terra, is buying $10 billion of Bitcoin. We're going to talk that through. As well as the flip side, Rona Network. Uh, there's a $625 million exploit slash hack. Uh, we're going to break that down as well. And then we've got our boy Alex here. So we're going to talk about <laughs> angel investing because he's a, a undercover a, a killer angel investor. Wait, Alex, would you even call it angel investing? Like at this point, like you have a full on fund, right? Is it even yeah, angel investing true. anymore? Yeah, but we don't call ourselves a fund. Like we are okay. an angel. We're an angel fund. So, okay, you're like, an angel fund. Okay. Yeah. Got it, got it. Yeah. All right. So yeah, we're going to get some some stuff on that. And then, uh, yeah, we're going to rant with with Alex. He's got some strong opinions on threads <laughs> and <laughs> Austin. <a> so we're, <laughs> <laughs> we're going to get to that in a bit. But Trung, I'll pass it over to you, man. I mean, you're our very own Me Master Flex. This last few days have been very well, difficult I mean, not is, to send I'll ask, every uh, meme to you guys. So. so this is my favorite one. This is the one that went the <laughs> hardest, right? This is from uh, everyone knows uh, for the, the listeners, not Jerome Powell. That's uh, Ali Farhat 79. That's that's one. I don't think there's many uh, Ali Farhats, uh, unlike Cohen's out there. But uh, <laughs> this uh, this meme killed me. It's just a picture of uh, Will Smith when he first heard the Chris Rock joke. Uh, and then uh, shortly after when uh, he was not very happy and had slapped Chris Rock. But it says mm -hmm. uh, when you get a 5% raise, but then remember that inflation <laughs> is 7.9%. That, that one killed me. But I have a question for Alex here, actually. So before we get into the ethics of whether or not you should slap someone for a joke, um, when moments like this happen, Alex, because I know you are a shit poster and memer, how energetic do you get and how hard are you trying to rush a meme out the door? Because you know the competition is just so intense to try to get that engagement. Trung was there ready with the Dave yeah. Chappelle bit. So, I was ready. You know I went viral that night, right? Continue. I mean, you, saw, you saw the tweet where I uh, I subtweeted Sahil Bloom and I was like, Chris or Chris Rock just got slapped in the face by Will Smith at the Oscars and I'm too oh, whiskey. Oh, I'm too whiskey's <laughs> deep. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. That's hilarious. Um, dude, I, I wasn't even watching the Oscars. <laughs> like all of a sudden I see Will Smith trending on the trending panel and I click. Okay. And I, and, oh, actually, no, I follow Dave Portnoy and Dave Portnoy okay. comes to the video and he's like doing the play by play. And I was like, what is happening? He shares the uncensored video. Will Smith just, you know, rocks Chris Rock. And I was like, oh, fuck, this is like pretty good content. And the first <laughs> thing that came to my mind was like, I'm two whiskeys deep. Here's 15 things that we can learn from this experience. Oh and, uh, and it, and it popped, it got four, 4,000 likes. Dude, I gotta, <laughs> I think, no, the thing I want to talk about is you nailed it is it's sick, right? When you're on Twitter enough, your first instinct, you're like, 
this is good content. It's not like, <laughs> wow, an assault just happened on national TV in front of 50 million people. Well, I guess 25 million or 15 million now. Nobody watches the Oscars. But uh, your first instinct was, how can I capitalize on this meme? Oh, yeah. A meme was born. I was going through comments and someone posted like the straight up, just the, the, the picture, the raw picture with nothing on it. I was like, this is a meme. I made the <laughs> meme. I posted it to a couple accounts and like, took off so are we memed out though that's the question i think that's what Bilal was talking about Bilal, you probably spent multiple hours that evening like oh, the rest of us even this this morning man i'm still <laughs> I, I listened to a whole podcast on it i mean it's <laughs> i mean i'm i'm like the comedy the comedy ones have been crazy i mean we'll, we'll get to the well, implications let's give it the of what is that what are the comedy go what are the comedy people saying well i think i mean i'll just give mine and also kind of what i'm hearing i i, I kind of thought this before like here in the podcast, it's just I'm like such a fan of comedy and like the ability to say anything in comedy is like very important to me. And like obviously to me, honestly, I, I might get in trouble for saying this. I think it was not even a top 10 offensive joke at any of those award shows. Like if you just watch Ricky Gervais, oh. Ricky Gervais, it probably did five in one sitting <laughs> that were a lot worse than oh, that. Oh, and the right? Golden so, Globes. Yeah, he'll exactly. rattle off 20 of them. And, exactly, uh, and, and I'm not saying it's, it's obviously, it, it wasn't a great joke, like it didn't land. It, I, I can understand why they would be upset by it, but like obviously, yeah, I mean, the take is don't go smacking people in the face, obviously, that, that doesn't seem that crazy to me. Alex, yeah, what I, I, think, I think he could have made his point by just like yelling and interrupting without the whole slap and like walking up, you know, his shoulders were like really, he was, he was in full stance mode. Oh, going that, yeah. there. The, the <laughs> still, <laughs> Can we talk about, he had incredible slap form. Like, he, he <laughs> he's learned like, that somewhere on the set or something. His whole like. body was it. And like, the, he just, like, it was just, it's like he had done that before. Like, multiple times. He's an actor, like, dude. Watch. He's an actor. He's an actor. Wait, <laughs> listen, we have the video the slap. <laughs> Oh my God. God the dude, he, that, is that's, terrible. that is a pickleball volley. <laughs> That is just a bam. Yeah, how long have you been in Austin, Alex? Jesus Christ. Dude, so I kind of, hold on, people. We kind of have this is wrong. This was an assault. <laughs> Having said that, the way he did it to Alex's point, that is like what you would do on a set of a film, right? To sell the slap. Like you said, he had the full follow through. Follow through and his was leg hard. came out. But actually, <laughs> Alex, to your point, about because I went deep on this, like I, I'm not gonna hide it anymore. I spent multiple hours doing research on this, and uh, <laughs> I found out to Alex's point about look like he'd done it before. So apparently, I don't know if you guys read this thread. Do you guys read the thread from Max Burns? He's a reporter, covers entertainment no. industry. Dude, this slapping is very prominent in Scientology. Scientologists oh do this all it's the, the time. It's the red pill segment. No, Here we go. I, we got okay, it. Early. No, I'm, the, I'm just gonna drop it here, okay? So, need- the, hold on. Who are the two most famous Scientologists? Tom Cruise, Will Smith, and John Travolta is also. Is, is Will Smith definitely Scientologist? Because I, I thought he's denied it. I thought he's okay, denied he is, it or something. Uh, yeah. This is news to me. Okay. The credible claims that Will Smith is a Scientologist, okay? This. <laughs> listen, people, this is not investment advice. And this yeah, is yeah. not this psychology is the, advice. All, all okay? vibes, no facts segment again. No, you again. guys can call on Max Burns here. This is what he says. He says, in Scientology, for uh, the hierarchy to hold its place, if an underling or someone under you in the hierarchy, you know, says something, a joke makes fun of you or embarrasses you, you have to make an example of them in public. I'm Googling but this. The word okay. underling is so funny yeah, as well. Okay, so well, <laughs> first of all, guys, one. hold on a second here. For the listeners, I had to pull up another video here. You guys saw the one about Will Smith slapping uh, a reporter uh, previously, right? Just a couple years ago. Here he is. A reporter grabbed before, his hand. Yeah. Fair enough. Don't grab Will Smith's arm. So Will Smith slaps him. Slaps him on the face. Okay. So Will Smith <laughs> has a history of slapping people on the face. So Alex, while you're searching whether or not I'm full of shit on the Scientology claim, Scientologists, this is the thing they do. In their crazy Scientology buildings, they slap each other around as a way of implementing seniority. Tom Cruise does this, by the way, not by slapping, but by yelling at people. So you've heard the audios of Tom Cruise just berating people. Have you guys heard this stuff? Oh, yeah. he's. Yeah. I've seen the Tom Cruise one. Also, okay. why, that's uh, the claim. Trung, I will say also <laughs> to me, all this time, every time you keep saying slap, I can only just... I just keep saying, like, how can she slap in my head? Do you remember this old, yeah, old yeah, yeah, funny the video? Yeah, yeah, 
that's the last time like the the slapping segment was uh was this famous but this is next level man so colin what did you find on your research am i full of shit uh Probably, but it's okay. It's a good. It's a good conspiracy theory. The 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 dots match up. We'll just we'll just roll with it. <laughs> all right. Then the last thing I want to talk about Will Smith is this, and you guys can compliment because we're all in relationships. Alex is married with a child. Bilal is in a long term so relationship. You? Yes, I so am I. Yeah. So I'm saying that all three of us have an opinion here. So this this meme that I just put up for the listeners, it's a video of what actually happened uh, with uh, Jada Pinkett Smith during the sequence of events that happens. Uh, Chris Rock makes a joke about uh, her bald head. Uh, she has alopecia, which is a condition where you lose your hair. Uh, Will Smith laughed at the joke, but then very quickly, it was no longer funny. And then when he sat down, his face became very serious. So William. the meme is showing the Jada Pinkett's reaction to it. So all I'm going to say is this. I'm not going to name names. But I, told, I spoke to a number of females that when I described the events of what happened, they said, we get it. No one's condoning it. No one's condoning it, but we get it. So that's the last question I'm going to leave to you guys. Did you hear anything similar? I just want to go on record and say Jada rocks the bald head. As a fellow bald person, incredible. I think she looks great bald. She rocks it. She doesn't have she like does. a fucking pointy head or anything. It's like, <laughs> it's a good look. It she does pull it off. 100%. <laughs> But uh, yeah, that's my last thought on it, guys. A conspiracy theory. Uh, that's the end. <laughs> I mean, so yeah, anything else to wrap that up? I mean, I know, Trung, you were going to talk a little bit about Oscars in general, like b before this whole thing happened, how how much it's gone down over the years and stuff as well. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, Alex, you, you said it, right? You didn't watch the Oscars. When was the last time you watched the Oscars? I don't remember last and, time I watched live TV for for anything. So. I didn't even know live TV still existed. <laughs> no, that, I mean, the Oscars used to be massive, right? It used to be the size of the Super Bowl. Like, even in the mm. 90s, they were getting 50 to 60 million viewers. And actually, the 90s was when it got crazy, like, super influential because uh, Harvey Weinstein, freaking mm -hmm. speaking of, like, Hollywood creeps, because he turned the Oscars event in the lead up to it with the Golden Globes and like uh, voters getting swag bags and like the DVD screeners. You remember I used to watch uh, the leaked movies. It always says, hey, this like DVD belongs to XYZ. It's not supposed to be leaked. This is all part of like this Oscars industrial complex where you got all this money involved to try to push a winner for best picture. And the reason you did that is because it actually used to make a huge difference in the 90s and early 2000s. Mm -hmm. If a movie won best picture, it would make tens of millions of dollars more at the box office. So like, as an example, American Beauty, you guys probably saw it with Kevin Spacey, who also has a pretty sordid history now, but it made $55 million before uh, it won Best Picture. Afterwards, it added another $100 million in the box office. So, like, the Oscars used to really matter, not just, like, culturally for Hollywood, but it was, like, great business. Did, and to did, you, did you write a thread on this yet? I did not, man. I should have. <laughs> I was thinking there's going to be a real serious one from Trung, the implications on free speech no, it from does, the slap. Man. Well, I mean, and, it's uh, a... It's like nobody watches it anymore. And all these things that have, I couldn't name you what won the last 10 best pictures. And uh, the bump they get now is irrelevant. Like Apple won for Coda. So Apple Plus, the move that won best picture Coda, is it really going to push like hundreds of millions of dollars worth of uh, uh, subscribers? But what it will do is it'll attract talent for them, right? It's a different mechanism now. So that's basically the, the economics of the Oscars, why it used to matter. And actually why now they have 15 million people watching it is a fraction of what it used to be, why the business is so bad now. Yeah, no one cares. I, I have no interest in watching the Oscars. I'm like, oh, they won Best Movie? Like, maybe I'll watch it on Netflix when it comes out in six months. Did you ever have interest? My parents did, not me. Well, I think parents, I, yeah. would, I, would, I would like hear, oh, this one, and I'd be like, oh, cool. Let me check if, I, if this corresponds with an IMDb rating that I think is worth <laughs> me checking out, basically. Because sometimes they give it to those like very artsy Hollywood type movies and you're like, this is dead. Like, what, how how oh, did yeah. this win an Oscar? But yeah, I mean, I will say the performance of uh, Will Smith in, was it King Richard for what he won? Yeah. He ended up winning Oscar that night for people that don't know, which probably no one by this point. I mean, that film was actually amazing. Did you guys watch this? No, the, I didn't it. Yeah, oh, it was really God. good. It was really I good. I really enjoyed that, yeah. But I mean, anyway, Will Smith, we're not condoning uh, hearing people here, but I, I guess the, just to wrap it up in a bow, Trunk, 
Any last thoughts on uh, on the Oscar stuff, mate? Well, you actually mentioned the IMDb thing. The one of the uh, the traces, uh, one of the things that traced back to kind of the irrelevance of the Oscars is when they didn't nominate Dark Knight for Best Picture in two thousand and nine. Like uh, mm. 2008, people lost their mind. And that's number two right now on IMDb's, or number three on IMDb's list. Which movie? Uh, the Dark Knight. Ah. Uh. So the year after that is when they expanded the Best Picture nominations from, it was only just five, that you could do up to 10. Because they never directly mm-hmm. acknowledged that it was a dark night, but everybody knew it, that was the reason. They're like, okay, listen, the if you guys can the people's favorite. Yeah, it's the people's movie, right? It's like this is why it's so irrelevant now. Like nobody, first of all, everything you guys said, nobody watches these uh, movies anymore, or the movies that are being picked are so indie, and the 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 the, the vertex of celebrity now has gone to like Instagram, uh, TikTok, and YouTube, like for uh, under thirty fives. It's actually pretty sad, man. The Oscars used to be dope. Yeah. Maybe we oh, should start was... a new Oscars. <laughs> a shit post Oscars. <laughs> yeah. I know Alice could be on top of that. The worst movie of 2021. Well, what the guys like, got that? The Razzies. The, the worst performance of 20, like like worst backup actor. We just like wrote <laughs> everyone <laughs> in Hollywood. Oh, just turn it in, just turn it into one of those. Uh, 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 what's it called? Like the Comedy Central uh, uh, roast, live roast. The roast yeah, of just whoever. for movies. Yeah. But well, that was the only part of the the these award shows that I liked was like when Chris <laughs> Rock is roasting people or when Ricky Gervais is making fun of everyone. Like to me, anyway, that was the only entertaining part. And then you might watch like, oh, there was a 20 second snippet of a speech that was actually good. But then for the last 10 years, it's just been rich actors coming up and lecturing everyone on like how oh, to be yeah. a better person while they're at a massive Oscar spy. Yeah, so, yeah Will, it was- Smith, Will Smith is going up doing a speech on like, we need to stop bullying in 2020. Let's <laughs> <and laughs> slap Chris Rock. Uh, to be a vessel of love, he said, <laughs> after slapping Chris yeah. Rock on the face. I mean, dude, again, it's assault, man. People, this is not funny. This is not never, funny. God. Never meet your heroes. Is yeah, what yeah. No, exactly, yeah. right? <laughs> Scientology, don't come after us. All right. Um, all right. So, boys, let's move on to the next one then. So, this is going to be a real quick one. I- I'll just share what's been going on. You guys have probably seen the price of Bitcoin, Ethereum. Everything has been green for the last week or so. Um, the main driver, from what I can see, again, is multiple factors, but our boy Du Quan, the founder of Terra, came out and announced that they're going to buy $10 billion. Have you guys seen this, by the way? I did uh, not pro- see this. So he's the founder of Terra, which is now a top 10, you know, crypto project. They've got a, a stable coin called UST. And without going down the rabbit hole and all the boring technical stuff, there's, there's, a, there's basically like a treasury and then a stable coin. And he's announced that they're going to be buying, uh, I think, up to $10 billion in Bitcoin. And uh, he's been approved to buy $3 billion. And now they've been making these huge, pay, uh, you know, like purchases, like 120 million. It's like Michael Saylor level um, stuff. Oh, so he's and bringing like the Michael Saylor type of ammunition into this. He's like, exactly, we're going to buy yeah. and put it in the treasury. Okay. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But so that's kind of, again, I don't know if that's the only thing that's driving it, but like narrative wise anyway, that's what I'm seeing. People uh, have been really bullish well, let me on bring this up actually, because last time Alex Cohn was here uh, was last May. I believe. Alex, you oh. were not invested in crypto at that time. Is this correct? Probably not. Ari, how invested are you now? And will you be doing a Do Kwan type move into Bitcoin? <laughs> <laughs> um, I am invested in several startups who are doing Web3 related okay. projects. I have some Bitcoin. I, I, I own it now. I have, Do- I have Dogecoin, but... That's about, I'd rather invest in like the people building the shit than the actual outcome of the token or coin or something like that. Could you talk to us then? Uh, we're we're going to get to your angel investing. We'll definitely talk about that. But your Bitcoin uh, investment between it's me down. and when you did invest, it is down. <laughs> what was the reason you did it though? What convinced you? Um, I was just looking at it as an interesting place to store some cash. Like, yeah. you know see what happens basically like over i i think i think bitcoin's inevitable like i don't think any of these any of these tokens or cryptocurrencies are going away i'm not sure they're going to 10x from here but you know looking at it as an interest like just like buying apple and i buy apple and tesla every week just like auto purchase right. so I, I was buying bitcoin for a while too on auto purchase like if i just set it and forget it i won't think about it maybe it'll be something well i've seen you you uh you you crowdsource investment ideas right I've seen you do it before. <laughs> yeah. What are some What are some other crowdsourced public stock equities that you purchased? Uh, Simon Property Group. Back okay, SPG. 
I'm yeah. more, very well, well aware during, of SPG. Is this yeah. what during the pandemic you mean? Yeah, during the, I made I made a good amount of money on SPG and Planet Fitness. You can thank Ramp Capital for that one. Um, <laughs> Planet legend. Fitness and Ramp is now an investor in my fund, which is hilarious. So oh we my went goodness. from like meme personalities to LPs. Uh, yeah, I mean some sh- like I didn't get into Shopify and and a few of these. Like even at the like I I kind of figured we were at a peak when I asked for the last investment advice. The number one stock that everyone told me to buy was Roblox. Okay. Um, I actually did not buy any because I kind of was like, ah, I feel like we're sort of reaching. And that was a really good gut intuition. Like everything's dropped off a cliff 30% since. So yeah. um, in terms of like early stage stocks, not a lot, but I love Apple and Tesla are my big ones. So I, I buy a shit ton of Apple and Tesla as a hedge against all the early stage stuff. Believer. By the way, I will say just a quick fun fact for people plant for people who don't know what Planet Fitness is. If you're not from the states, because <laughs> uh, I didn't know until I moved here, uh, it's the only gym I've ever heard that gives free bagels out to people. So is this <laughs> there's, a whole, there's a whole bus feed there. I'm actually looking at it right now. I, I sh- share my screen. It's the most hilarious listicle of things you only see at Planet Fitness. First of all, there's free pizza. <laughs> Secondly, there's free bagels. Um, yeah. Hold on, go back to the bagels. Rolls. Okay, but, <laughs> but let's, can we talk about bagels from a nutritional perspective for a second? <laughs> Yo, hit it. They, they are actually not that bad for you. They're like 12 grams of protein, 65 <laughs> grams of carb, and like hardly any fat. They are great for- For workout, uh, post-workout. Yeah. They're great for post-workout. Yeah, even pre-workout, you get that carb load, then you go lift. I mean, no one at Planet Fitness is lifting heavy, but like you need that sort of carb boost before. Um, Planet Fitness is a fucking weird place. I worked out there for a bit when I like couldn't afford more than a $10 a month gym membership. And their lunk alarm, you're like scared of throwing your weights down or they have an alarm that'll go off if you throw the weights down too heavy. And then I don't know if they like escort you out or something. That's hilarious. <laughs> That is, that's actually a very uh, thoughtful uh, device at a gym, man, because there are some people get real aggressive uh, on those deadlifts. You're supposed to lift heavy, though. How are you? How are you, How do you lift heavy if you can't throw the weights down? That's actually a great point. And it's an injury risk, right? Because if you're let's say you're getting the full Olympic thing going, if you're yeah. doing like push squats or snatches and you got to like gently put it down, <laughs> you're, literally gonna in, no, you're actually going to injure yourself. Yeah, you're going to pull out your back. Yo, man, yo, Planet this Fitness, man. This is not man. health advice. Yeah. Uh, I would say this is No way, Alice not. works for Carbon Health, man. This is health advice. <laughs> Very controversial yeah, stuff already. That bagels I'm are Alex not, Cohen, not, not bad for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Don't play one on the internet. Anyway, um, all right, boys. So just to bring it back, that's my job here. we got to just quickly rattle off the Rona Network yeah. thing, and then we'll get on to Alex's stuff. So that's kind of the, the high-level stuff on our boy Duquan, he's he's bringing some some big energy for this. Um, Trunk, you shared this this morning about the Rona network. Uh, it says here that it may be the largest exploit in DeFi history. For people that don't know, Axie Infinity, which is a play to earn uh, game, like in Web3 game that we've talked about on the show many times. Um, they use this thing called Rona network. The only reason I know, I've got a small amount of money sitting in there staked on um, like the Ronan wallet. So yeah. I did look into this because I was like, damn, is my my money lost? But from what it says, uh, well, actually, Trunk, you read this. Is there yeah, anything you want to GLDR. summarize on it? I don't know the mechanics of it. Like I read it, I'm like, this is, doesn't make any sense. Which is what I'm gonna ask uh, Alice yeah, about yeah. as an investor. Cause I was reading this, I'm like, this stuff is so over my head. So apparently Ronan is like a side chain or it is a side chain, right? And it's uh, Axie Infinity is using it basically to as a way to put money in and out of the Axie Infinity game uh, because it's much lower fees than just using uh, any of the other uh, kind of chains. And the TLDR was basically hackers, um, the way it's, the Ronin is done with proof of authority. So uh, if you had five out of nine validators, like green light a, a, a transaction, they could just pull the money out. That's basically what happened. Uh, Axie got hacked and five of these nodes were uh, meant to validate these transactions, validated 600 million plus uh, of money being pulled out of the, the network. So that's the TLDR of it. But the effect of the Axie is more like the people that are getting mad about it is there's two parts, right? It's like, oh, look, it's another crypto scam. There's one. The other people are getting mad at like very specific to Axie Infinity. It's like, you guys have raised so much money from Andrew. 
industries. And you guys are like the best well-known uh, play to earn game uh, in this space. And you couldn't put all those funds toward a little bit of security because they, their export itself sounded very, very simple. And I think that's what people are getting pissed off about. So I would throw this to Alex and I think it's a good transition into your broader investing. It's like, so you mentioned that you do do investing in the crypto space uh, and some web three companies. So when you're looking at it, how much on the technical side are you understanding? Because when something like this happens with the rodent network, like you read this stuff, I literally could not understand what was really going on here. So how do you think about this stuff? So I don't invest in protocols. So okay. like I, so, so this stuff's way over my head. Like I have the article pulled up from Coindesk right now and I like don't understand how half of these hacks happen. Yeah. I'm yeah. just investing in the consumer facing like end use of, of, of all this stuff. So like one of the companies I invested in is building a way for you to like buy access to your, to like a squad And it's like one, you know, it's like an influencer says, Hey, like buy my coin and you buy enough coins and you're like part of that squad. And then you can unlock like real experiences or like set, like every influencer effectively has like a liquid marketplace of their own coin, but I'm not investing in like whatever the underlying tech is that's powering that, that, if that makes sense. You like, you are a consumer focused, like investor, right? Yeah. Primarily FinTech. Is that, is that right? No, uh, actually, digital health is the big one, and okay. then um, and then fintech, and then a lot of enterprise SaaS. But then there's like a few of these like random Web three startups that we've invested in. But yeah, like another one that we just did was um, they're gonna let you use the the crypto that you have sitting in your wallets to invest in REITs and like other real estate assets, and you don't actually have to like pull it out, convert it to USD, like go buy real estate um, investments. But like, however they're doing that and we're not investing in the shit that's under the hood. Mostly the, the end use consumer applications for people. How does the mechanic on that, the REIT one work? So like you have money sitting there, they, are they putting up money and basically investing on your behalf? And creating yeah, contract? I think you're, you're transferring your crypto out of your like MetaMask wallet into like their holdings and they're investing okay. in real estate and then you're earning a yield. But you don't have to go and actually like convert not sell it. to USD and then, yeah. Because if you sell it, it becomes taxable event and all that mess opens up. Got it, got it. Yeah, yeah. And so I like that. I'm like, cool. You know, there's probably hundreds of billions of dollars sitting in crypto wallets looking for a place to go make money besides just whatever they're, uh, you know, you also don't want to lose on the upside of, you know, Bitcoin could pop, ETH could pop. Like you don't want to lose on that upside either. That's actually a really smart a way just to use kind of the idle uh, uh, crypto because we talked about in the past, right? It's like, when we had Tom Osmond here uh, talking about the guy uh, selling the Ether Rock for a mail, it's just like, man, people are just sitting with tens and hundreds of millions of dollars of Ether in their wallets, right? They just don't, they just want to do crypto native things. Like they don't want to convert it to fiat <laughs> and like dick around in the fiat world anymore. It's yeah. really smart. So that's what they're doing. I can't share who they are yet because they're still stealthy and like, I'll wait until the founder. Next time I come on the podcast in another year, I'm sure they'll be live. And so we can, we can pump it then. But um, yeah, you know, it's, it's stuff like that. So when we're saying, you know, like new coins and protocol, like I'm not getting into the weeds. I'm not reading white papers. Like this just, I don't have time for that shit. So most of my investments are digital health though. Cause I do understand that. How many pitches are you getting a week in general? 30, 40, maybe. What's your process? You have a full-time job. Like, listeners just understand here. <laughs> Alex Cohen is working like 40 hours a week at Carbon Health and I think 20 hours a week shit posting. It's all leaving a lot of time <laughs> for this investing stuff. <laughs> oh, what? But you, have, you also have a partner, Brett I McDonald. Did. Is that right? Okay, so yeah. you guys are getting all this uh, inbound. So what, how are you dealing with it? And kind of what are your broad uh, uh, metrics and, and, and the heuristics for picking? Yeah. So I, I do like look at everything that hits my Twitter DMs and inbox and text messages, like the three ways in which deals get to my computer. Okay. Um, I know pretty quickly, like one, there's a lot of pitches I get that are just like, I don't do consumer social. I'm not doing like this marketplace thing. I'm not doing e-com. And so those, you could just be like ruled out, ruled out. And sometimes I'll write back other times. Like if someone hasn't gone to my website and like, I very clearly have said, I invest in digital health, fintech, and SaaS. And they're like, here's a fucking consumer social startup. Are you like, no, I'm not interested. It's on my website. And so I just sometimes don't even write back. 
for the, I would say the majority of deals that we do are like second degree referrals from VCs or from angel investor friends. So typically like in any given day, I'll get a text that says, Hey, have you seen this deck? It's from a friend who's either like leading around or they're investing into the round or like it's a founder who like knows a founder, the rounds getting closed. And so we'll meet the founder. We, we have a very good selection process, I think, in terms of getting to like, this is something we're interested in. It's legit founders. There's no fundraising risk. Like the round's going to close. There's either a lead or they're like 60% of the way through. Once those things are checked off, then like we'll take a call, meet with the founder, get a sense, is the market big? Is the founder legit? Do they have the right team? Like all the things that, that you would try to suss out in a 30 to 45 minute call. We chat about it and we're like, this is a good bet or it's a not a good bet. And that's basically the process. And so far it's been going okay. Like granted the market was crazy last year. So it's hard to know if anything's real, but I don't know, 40% of our companies raised follow on funding after we invested and um, things seem to be going well so far. Well, how many of those deals do you do? We Are you in like a deal a week kind of a cadence right now? Yeah, about uh, three a month is kind of the average between, but there's two of us, right? So it's like two part-time make one super part-time. And uh, because yeah, 20 hours a week ship posting, 80 hours a week at Carbon. Um, I would say at this point, like the fund deal flow comes a lot more naturally because my network's really large. And so people just like send me stuff or like, I know a founder from a while ago who's raising. And so if I didn't have that network, this would be like an impossible thing to do without without being full-time. And this network is just from your previous, like this is like Carbon, you previously sold the startup to. So like you've been in the game for a while. This is like, yeah, 10 years of just meeting hundreds or thousands of people who work, who work in tech, basically across like founders, VCs, um, early stage operators, like even, even Carbon, right? If you look at our team, a lot of the team has been around the block a bunch of times. Like, Aaron founded Udemy before starting Carbon. Um, Russ Frayden, who's our vice chairman, is like a prolific angel investor, sold two companies for a lot of money. Um, There's a lot of like legit people. And so that network just grows exponentially over time, the longer that you stay, I think, in in tech. Yeah, Alex, uh, you're based in, you were based in on the West Coast, right? You're now in Austin. We're going to talk about that in a bit. But um, since COVID and the last couple of years, How have you seen the shift between doing stuff, obviously virtually when we had to do it versus now when you can actually start seeing people again? And yeah, I'm just curious, have have you seen like a big shift in needing to be in a particular hub? Um, So, all right, I'll I'll sort of separate the question into two parts because there's like the actual investment, like what companies am I, like do I need to be somewhere to invest in companies? And then the second question is, do I need to like live somewhere to, to work near the team that I'm working with every day. And like, is that a broader trend on the investment side? Most of my investments are still in the Bay area, LA, New York. Like those are kind of the three hubs. I actually have not invested in any Austin based companies. As far as I'm aware, I invested in one Dallas based company, but like mostly SF New York are kind of the, the big two hubs. I think you still see the majority of really, I would say like top tier ambitious founders in those two hubs. Um, they were either like ex Uber or early Airbnb. And they're just like still in the Bay area. They have families that are living in South Bay or East Bay, like whatever it is. But, um, I think you're seeing a lot of people start still move out of the Bay area. They either just like work for a larger company. And so like the large companies went fully hybrid. It was like, Hey, come into the office if you wanted to, now that things are safe. But by this time, everyone's just moved. And so no one's in a particular hub, even us, we're closing our San Francisco office and we're opening up San Mateo in Oakland. And so it'll be for like East Bay people and South Bay people. But a lot of our team has moved to LA, a few in Austin. Um, we have a bunch on the East coast, Florida, like just all over. And so I don't see a huge value at this point of being in the Bay area, which is why I moved. If I thought there was still value for me, particularly being there, I would have stayed, but I'm going back once a month and that's enough for me. Well, I get, and I guess to reframe the question, you've spent like however many years, like meeting thousands of people, right? A lot of that probably happened in person in Silicon Valley. For someone who's like young and ambitious listening to this now, do you think they need to go and move, in your opinion, to one of those hubs to accelerate that? Or do you think they can have as equal amount of success 
shit posting on Twitter and connecting yeah, people let's, let's ask through that. podcasts, could, stuff like that. Could someone shit post on Twitter their way to the glory? <laughs> or do they look, need- look, look at Turner, Ann Arbor, Michigan. Now he's mm. a fucking solo GP fund. Oh, Turner Novak. This is true. Turner Novak, uh, 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 for the listeners and the viewers that are un- unaware, definitely at Turner Novak. Uh, you're right. That is Midwest, right? He's like, not even, literally right. from Ann Arbor, Michigan. He yeah. interneted his way into uh, VC. So, so that here's is a- one of one. Is he one Do of I- one? Is he one yeah. of one though? Yeah, I think he's, he's one of one. I mean, here's what I would say is like, if you're young and ambitious, like you need to be somewhere where you can meet a whole bunch of people in person, whether you're a founder or early employee, like I would go to a city where you think there's going to be the most amount of people similar, like in a similar age group, similar industry that like you build that network, that network grows with you as you get older. Like I still think that there is a large number, like there, there are still a lot of people who live in SF. It's not a bad place to live or to be. Um, I think there's a lot of people in Austin, like, but it depends if you're starting a company, most of the, like, I still think that there's validity in being in a major tech hub. It's still a lot easier to recruit there. Like a lot of the execs still, they have families, they have kids, their kids have friends. Like they're just not moving. They can't just pick up and go. It's a luxury to do that. Um, And I would say like, I don't know, based on what I know, like, for example, the Brex founders moved to LA, the whole exec team disbanded from SF and moved all over the country. Um, so then employees follow suit. They're like, why do we need to be here? Like no one's working in person. Let's go somewhere else. Um, I think what we'll see is like less of your network being built with the people that you work with. Cause no one's working in person and uh, more of your network being built of like, how do I meet like-minded individuals who live in the same city as I do? And like, yeah, there are a lot of fucking happy hours in Austin. I don't think it's a bad place to be like, you can go to a happy hour three times a week um, or like a tech meetup, but uh, I still think it's a growing community where you don't still have the same like Cal. I think we will start to get it. Apple is moving here. Tesla's moving their HQ, um, Facebook, Google, like all these companies are bringing a lot of really high caliber talent here. I still think it's a growing community though. Yeah, fair enough. What about Vancouver trunk? I know because you've done you've done. I don't know how much you talk about Bruh. this. So well, uh, we that. have talked about. It. I mean, like yeah, Vancouver is actually interesting because the, all the companies that uh, Alex just mentioned, like Facebook, uh, Microsoft, Amazon, they all have a presence here. Um, a lot of it actually over the last decade was because of the immigration so hard in the states. So they would just put an outpost in Vancouver. It's the overflow. Yeah, an overflow. <laughs> and I mean, think about it. You're Amazon. You're two hours away from Vancouver. Uh, the Seattle and not office. a bad place to live. A lot yeah, of people want to live there. Yeah, it's not a bad place sure. to live. The, you can pay absolute trash here uh, because of how low just the, the 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 like the median salary in Vancouver is a joke. It's an absolute joke, right? Isn't it super expensive to live there too? The the home it's very difficult to buy a home. To it buy has a one home, of the right? highest yeah. uh, like detached single median home values to salaries in the world. Because at least in listen, it's crazy, obviously, in the Bay, right? I mean, Alex, you know this. Even in Austin, is getting very overpriced. Palau's in New York. Shit's expensive. But at least in these areas, you can get paid. You can get paid in San Francisco. You can get paid in New York. Dude, Vancouver, I think the median salary here is like 60K, like starting. So like Canadian. So you're talking about 50 US. And the house, but you're talking about a detached house is 1, 1. 1.5. So... Yeah, the, the, the joke of man, you need your parents, like bank of parents, like that's the reality in Vancouver. Yeah, and obviously, I mean, we, we've been talking on this show, like I could do a whole episode about Vancouver real estate. So much of it is, it, it is the Chinese money that's come up over the last twenty years. It's just insane, right? It's just the, the flood yeah, of same money, in London money as well, right? Like these. they just yeah. Well, we talked about like on the Russian the episode cities, right? with it's like the London, oligarchs. Sydney, Los Angeles, uh, San Francisco, Miami, New York, Miami. Yeah, these places where all. There, in the, at the end of the day, there's 10 to 15 places where the richest people in all the world they want to live, right? And like that's where all the money goes. And uh, even Vancouver, if they don't live there, they're parking their money there. They're parking their money there. Yeah. Uh, Vancouver is a huge one because of the uh, the connection with uh, China. Um, when when Hong Kong got handed over in 97 from the British back to the Chinese, um, massive influx of uh, Hong Kong uh, mm. citizens because they didn't want to be under the Chinese rule, right? You know, that's fair enough. That's her choice. But uh, that's where the history from Vancouver comes from. And then just super lax here, man. It's like really, yeah, it wasn't great. Again, I think it's comparable to where you two guys are. So it's not going to be shocking to you guys. But uh, yeah, Vancouver's not great. But to answer your question, Bilal, about tech, there's some interesting stuff here. I think uh, I was thinking, sorry, to clarify, I was talking about like, like, uh, 
as if you've I think you've done some deals right like angel investing style deals so I'm curious for you and you might be doing more in the future so I'm curious for you like do you think oh, being there one, makes a difference yeah, I it's for me it's just from the internet I'm not like I'm not like Alex the OG here that's been on <sighs> yeah, the valley yeah, yeah. I mean even Bilal you probably get better deal flow from the valley than me I mean, you were there actually you didn't work in Google uh, SV did you you worked in Google New York uh, no, I was in New York, but I worked a lot with the other offices as well. Yeah. But where are you now? I'm in New York. Oh, okay. Yeah, it gets very confusing. I've got a six five zero number and a British accent, and throws <laughs> everyone off. Yeah, Dude, six five zero is Mountain View, so. Well, how much time have you spent in Mountain View? Like uh, quite a lot. I probably go there every. I mean, I, not and not recently, but I used to go there. I used to go there in LA a lot because a lot of my clients were in LA. But obviously, the mother ship is in. SF. So you, we used to go there like every three to six months normally. Fair enough, man. Well, I think this is the perfect segue then. We, we want to tee it up. Alex, yeah, we go. <laughs> San Fran versus Austin. Hit us, man. Tell us what you've experienced and your thoughts. I mean, you've touched on some of it. But and how now. many breakfast tacos have you had today? Because I see you posting those, man. They're looking too okay. good. <laughs> so not, not, not today, but since I've moved, I've had a lot of breakfast tacos. But as you know, I'm on Whole30 right now, okay. so I can't eat breakfast tacos. <laughs> that was the segue into the nutrition conversation. Here we okay. go. <laughs> Remember, no, go he Doc, not a doctor, but he works for Carbon Health. So tell us, <laughs> make sure you do Whole30 uh, before you get into the Austin versus SF, and then how are you feeling right now? Um. Okay, so Whole30, what convinced who it was who convinced me to do it, and it was actually Ramp. So okay, Ramp so Capital, the, uh, we were talking about like fucking weightlifting and, and eating, and he's like, dude, do Whole30. I was like, what is Whole30? And he just starts blasting me with stuff. He's like, here's this link, here's this book, go read this, go do that. It's life changing. He's like, I've done it now with like ten people in my life. It's changed their lives. And I was like, all right, Ramp, like I believe you, I'll do it. And I started <laughs> it on Sunday. Um, so far, we'll, I mean, it take, they say it takes about eight to 14 days to start to really feel the effects. We're on day three. So do I need to go through what it is real quick for everyone? Yeah, yeah what's the what summary? What are you cutting out? All right, Whole30 is 30 days of no gluten, no dairy, no legumes, no soy, no alcohol, and no artificial sugars or added preservatives. Caffeine, no tacos. Like caffeine. Yeah, no yeah tacos. you can drink like black coffee, totally fine. Okay. Okay. Um, you, and there are certain things you can have, like you can have like clarified butter, like ghee, basically. You can have avocado so my people oil. have. Sorry. That's it. So like, ghee is very popular in the the brown community. Yeah, it's great. I use <laughs> it this morning. They put that shit in the tea, man. It's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> Anything tastes good with ghee in it. Just just try it. I, I, uh, I made my scrambled eggs this morning with it. But yeah, you can basically have like eggs, nuts fruits veggies and meats is kind of like your whole state for, for 30 days it basically resets your entire metabolism you remove all the inflammatory foods from your diet and by the end of 30 days you reintroduce these foods every like two to three days and you start to see which of them impact your body the most so you can build like a long-term holistic diet around the foods that actually impact you but it takes 30 days for you to wipe the slate clean. Like I was eating fucking Lucky Charms with protein powder for breakfast. Now <laughs> protein I'm not. Powder, that's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm not. And so, uh, you know, my body is gonna like go through a big reset. I'm like shocking the body by removing like all these artificial high fructose corn syrups from my body. So, um, so that's 30 days of Whole30. I'm on day three. I've had no bread in the last three days and no, I used to eat like a tub of Greek yogurt today. I'm not doing that anymore. So my body is very confused at the moment. So well, what I want to say is that the the, uh, the Lucky Charms of protein powder sounds like the most startup cliche deal in, in, in that guy. No, I don't have time to do anything. Give, give me the Lucky Charm and this whey protein. <laughs> and then ramen with protein powder for dinner. That was <laughs> it. Okay, so disgusting. you were eating tacos for breakfast before this. So you're in SF now. You were enjoying the local cuisine that the city had to offer. Well, so I was in, I just want to clarify. So I was two years in SF when I first moved out and then okay. my first company got acquired and moved to New York area. We were living in Hoboken. Okay. And then okay. mid pandemic, we moved back to the Bay area, but we went to San Mateo instead of San Francisco. So we were okay. always like 20 to 30 minutes South of SF for the last couple of years. So Austin way better than fucking Bay area. I am going to go on record and say that, although like, 
you know, someone's definitely going to call me on and be like, you've loved everywhere you've moved and you moved five times in the last 10 years. And it's like fair, but, um, I, I actually have loved Austin. So like quality of life is really easy. Things are 30% cheaper. Like you don't feel like you're paying California your entire paycheck just to live in nature, which was like how we felt by the end of living in, in the barrier was like, wow, all of our income is going to California so that we can like look at one fucking mountain in Mountain View. And then <laughs> like, that was it. The other thing is like, I, I guess I'll give away my age, but I'm turning 29 in two weeks. And to have a baby at 29 years old in, in like the Bay Area is basically being on an episode of 16 and pregnant. Like everyone is 10 years older than you. Everyone waits until they're like in their late 30s to have kids. And that's totally fine. I don't care what people do but it makes it impossible to make friends like other, you know, stay at like my wife's a stay at home mom. There's no stay at home moms in Mountain View. It's just all like nannies basically. And so that's a great point. That is a very, I mean, that is a super fair, uh, uh, we, me and my wife were dealing with it too. It's like, we had our kid, even we're talking like a two year gap, dude, like Alex, you know, the difference like between four and two, you can't really play with a two year old kid when you have a four year old, right? Like the, the no. cognitive mismatch is just still too much. <laughs> but, like you're talking hey, literally 10 years. Trunk, how old were you when you had your first, when you had your kid? Thirty-three. Th- All right, cool, cool. Yeah, yeah. But I, yeah, uh, Alex, yeah, twenty-nine. You definitely. I mean, that is the early, crazy man. thing That's is, kind of twenty-nine early, for our parents' generation <laughs> was that you had three kids and you're Yo, oh, almost easy for our generation. Yeah, no, like but it, twenty-nine. But it's it's not early if you live in like fucking Kansas Exa- or Texas completely. or Florida. It's only early if you're in SF, New York, in these or LA. coast areas. Yeah. Completely, yeah. because we're all trying to be babies until we're thirty-nine. Well, so. Zadie, let's uh, blah, let, let, let's tease it out. What, what's the plan here, buddy? Are we, <laughs> we got one on deck? Are we letting it loose on it? No, I'm. I'm a, my age is I'm 34 in June, so I'm still, uh, you're, you're, still you're got still, a little bit of time. time buddy. Unless, you, yeah, no rush, buddy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm not in a rush, man. But, uh, <laughs> but, but yeah, it's anyway, been, cool, it's cool that you you guys decide just to go for it. Yeah, I mean, and, and all, like my wife's made friends. They go to the fucking science museum and the pool and the parks together. They go to like Orange Theory. And, and I've met a bunch of people here so far. And it's <laughs> been, but it's been great. Like that just didn't exist in, and we like tried, we tried to find other parents our age with kids and it just like was not a thing. And um, I will say the one last driver for us was our families on the East coast in Florida coming out to help with the baby was a six hour trip. It took all day, like going back, you lose, you know, you know, that trip from SF to New York where you lose three hours plus it's six hours traveling. Now it's a two and a half hour flight, one hour time change and oh, uh, game changer. Yeah. Super game. And like, and we can also afford a house out here. Like I'm not rich enough to buy a house in San Mateo for fucking $8 million now for a four bedroom. And we were able to buy a house in Austin that we're, that we're closing. Well, once up. this web three real estate thing pops off, you'll be yeah. more than rich. You'll be owning multiple houses in Mountain View, brother. Yeah. Mountain View in the metaverse. <laughs> hey, so you, um, you have posted photos online of uh, the crib. You're building a house. Is that right? Yeah, building a house, uh, 2,400 square feet, a third of the cost of what it would have been in Mountain View. Did you sneak it in before the mortgage rates went up? Did you have to take uh, out a building loan? No. Well, so we, we signed the contract before rates hiked, but you can't lock in rates unless you're 90 days out. And we're not uh, we're 90 days out. So, But it's fine. We're going to work with like a private bank that works with early startup employees, the rate should still be like around 3%. Well, once they see like your, your, your angel portfolio, man, they're going to give you a very <laughs> reasonable rate. They're going to be, oh man, you are, you're basically a doctor, sir. Al, <laughs> we're going to treat you in the doctor bracket, uh, Al, Mr. Alex Cohen. <laughs> or can we call you I, doctor? Can we call you <laughs> Dr. Cohen? My dad is Dr. Cohen. Oh yeah. Well, there you go. Well, if uh, if uh, push comes to the shove, you get the cosign and you'll get the lowest there rate we possible. Go. Now we should be good. We uh, hopefully sometime this summer we'll lock in a rate, be done, move on with life, and stop going through mortgage applications. Well, we uh, uh, our boy uh, Jack Butcher, who you uh, so kindly replaced this episode. He, uh, I don't know if you uh, were familiar with some of his shenanigans, but he sold uh, a number of board apes to fund a home purchase. He went from clicks to bricks, and uh, the going through the mortgage application and trying to explain the source of funds was a little bit difficult. <laughs> That's great. How many apes did he own? Ah, uh, a, a lot. A, a lot. I think he, uh, I don't know if he 
as you said on here. He's he. It's more. It's it's plural. It's not singular. It's plural. It's definitely plural. Yeah, no, no. I don't think he has many left or any left now. But he he bought quite a lot. I mean, he talked about on the podcast when they were three hundred, four hundred dollars or something, and uh, well, he bought quite uh, well, a few. Alex, you laugh real hard. Uh, uh, what like ten episodes ago, we were talking about why did you uh, kind of make the decision to leave? He's like. I went to uh, uh, NFT New York City and NFT NYC, and I'm like, okay, he saw what it was all about. I'm like, you know what? I think I'm good. I think it was definitely not this, Soho House like it yeah, was pitched. If this yeah. is what board apes are getting you, like in uh, in real life, I think uh, I think I'm pretty good with uh, how far it's gotten, and uh, I'm gonna try to buy a house now. That's great. Wait, where is he based? Nashville. He's in Nashville nowadays. Oh, um, oh, he's uh, he's not too far from me. Yeah. So, He's in Nash Vegas. Nash Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Alex, we also need to get your take on this, man. We've heard you're not a fan of Twitter Twitter threads, and you're talking Only to trunks. Mr. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I was gonna say Trung has got a few Twitter threads. Uh, what's the deal, man? Just let us just let it out. Just hit it, bro. Just rant oh, one again. You are a Twitter guy. Just this tell is your us rant. your hate. This yet. is your Twitter when thread. When you see rant. a Twitter thread on the timeline. And we don't have to name names or anything. Listen, I you know I'm names. guilty. I'm a guilty Twitter threader, right? I'm thirsty. I know what I'm doing. I want you to rant about it. Why do you get so triggered? Oh, man. Well, so we both know that the hack to Twitter is like you post threads, they go viral, people follow you. It doesn't matter what the content is. It can be the shittiest content in the world. Threads drive followers, shit posts drive engagement, right? That's, that's fucking Twitter. Yeah, that is Twitter. Yeah. How, and now you have all these fucking thought boys who have come in and they are, they're racking their brain five times a week, trying to figure out overgeneralized bullshit content threads to write. And that's all they do. They, they're just like, oh, one podcast can change your life. Here's 10 podcasts that could change your life. And then they fucking regurgitate other people's content take credit for the thread, they go viral, they gain followers, and it becomes this fucking endless loop of seeing the shittiest content on the timeline. And okay, so okay. I don't, I don't, I mean, there, I don't think I've read one thread from the group of people that we're talking about where I've been like, wow, this is actionable advice. I want to live my life to these values. It's just like, it's engagement bait. That's all it is. They're, they are ruining my Twitter experience with engagement bait. <laughs> is it their fault or is it Twitter's fault? To be honest here, like to, they're it's, feeding it's, the no, beast. It's, it's all the Twitter followers who are supporting this habit. Okay. Support, the, these, are, these are Twitter engagement addicts and we are all supporting their habit. You're, it, it is, it is I, I do want to say here, it is addictive. I mean, let's be honest here. <laughs> Alex, when you go viral and I've seen you've had a lot of, you've had some, you've had some absolute bangers, brother. <laughs> How addictive is that dopamine drip? Let's just be honest here. I'll be uh, honest. It is. It Twitter's a dopamine machine. I know it. I I it's so unhealthy how I use Twitter. So you know, in a way, I understand what you're saying, and I do agree with it. I kind of I'm kind of blaming Twitter here. Listen, if they're rewarding it, they're rewarding it so hard. These tweets, uh, these tweet threads, it's absolutely wild, man. It's absolutely wild. It's, yeah, they're 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 pumping that shit for extra engagement. They love it. I don't know. I mean, look, I get I, I'm a hypocrite saying all this because like all I do is shit posts for engagement. But I will say I think the biggest difference, and I, I will bucket you in the same category as me, is the shit posts come from a place of authenticity. It's not like inauthentic. Right. I'm writing shit for the sake of like these people are fucking doing this to eventually have enough followers to launch a course charge some dipshits money to pay for the course and then like turn it into a grift. I am not grifting Twitter. I'm not turning my ship. Like I'm not trying to like continue to post this fucking, you know, endless cycle of threads to eventually charge for a course and like, and like get people on some grift. Okay. You're so you're saying like the intent of why you're doing this matters, right? Like I will yeah. be very honest. Like I'll tell you why I do it. I literally only want to grow an audience. And I think Alice will, uh, will, like the sentiment i just want more people to see my memes that's literally i'm being very honest man it's like uh, listen they're good memes though yeah, I was gonna say, they're, they're math. Great memes. <laughs> it's just math more people are gonna see my memes at 360,000 followers than at 3,000 followers it's just pure math i'm like and if twitter is telling me the only way to grow that audience like literally that is the only way 
unless you're freaking Elon Musk or of this nature of a, a, a famous person, there is no other way to do it. That's the sad part. There's no other way to grow on Twitter. That's just the reality. Yeah, no, I mean, it's all the threads. The threads drive followers. I don't know why. I don't know why they reward threads with followers, but that's just what happens. And so like whenever I've got a founder or like an executive is like, how do I grow my Twitter followers? I'm yeah. just like, write, write threads, dude. That's the only way that you're going to grow your fo- Like Again, the shit posts, people laugh, they like them, but even when they pop and it gets five, 10,000 likes, the follower counts are minimal compared to posting a thread, even if it gets a quarter of the like. So, oh no, you saw, I, I remember know. you had, I think you had one with like 30,000 likes and you sent me, it's like, dude, I got like two followers. On this. <laughs> yeah, the bed, the bed frame tweet. Yeah, the bed, that's uh, out. If you go to an, at another Cohen, you'll see it's pinned to his profile. It's just beautiful. But that's I, a beauty. I do think intention matters. And I, I think, the people who are posting these threads, like when they're saying, here's my top 15, like life advice tips, they are not actually trying to give people genuine advice. They're coming up with the most overarching generalized BS list to drive follower accounts with an intention to either like sell you some shit down the road or to pump a course. And I don't like that. That doesn't sit well with me. It's like the fucking Tony Robbins of tweet threads. <laughs> Jesus Christ. All right. Uh, I will say, just to not to well, over be, uh, yeah, be this. The I'm trying to be party, objective yeah. here. So I, I'm <laughs> talking to two people who are both on one end of the spectrum of using Twitter for fun. You have your own life. You have your own family. You got jobs. You earn your own money. And I 100% agree the generic ones of like you literally have templates. Like there's software that people use that has here's a template. Use 15 things to blah, blah, blah. And that stuff I also find annoying and boring. I will say there's plenty of people that I've seen that write really good threads and I'm like, oh man, I actually learned something or it was kind of but like that's, simplified. That's not what I'm referring to. Yeah, yeah, you're, not, yeah, you're yeah. referring to the really annoying like clickbaity ones. I will I actually mean, tell you, Bill, to your point, and I think I would like your opinion. Of, you want to know what actually kind of salvaged the thread format? And this, I mean, I'm not saying this in like, uh, this is, sounds pretty cynical, but it's true. It's like, since the Russian invasion of Ukraine, do you know how many people have been using the thread forum? Because there's loads of experts, right? Which don't remember the trucking. There's a wheel truck expert that yeah. is writing. That was a great thread. thread. But yeah. What I mean is like, <laughs> but what I mean is like, he has written a dozen of those, and they're all amazing, right? Yeah. But like, this has happened in. But that's in the so point. Many- it's- it's yeah. not the threads. It's not the thread format. To me, it's not really a thread thing. It's like people right. writing clickbaity stuff. Like they also make yeah. just people that also on the other side make memes for like the intent for them is just to get dopamine hits too, or to you know whatever you want to say, just to get like engagement or whatever. So personally, you might have noticed I haven't been writing anything on Twitter, even on Instagram. I haven't posted a picture <laughs> on Instagram for two years. I went on it the other day. I'm like, what was the last thing I posted? It Your was like dopamine levels the- must be so healthy no, right now, bro. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. No, and it's, and it's not because Charm, I don't Charm see and the- I are just clinically depressed over here. Yeah. Living the best life. No, Twitter's still amazing. It's just that I've, I've kind of been a little sick of everything for a while and it, I needed a nice retreat. That's why I do the podcast. Every week we do the podcast. We've done it every week for a year. And the reason is this is how I get my thoughts out. We get to talk about it. Yeah, yeah you're not going to have 100,000 people listen every week versus a tweet. But like I get to talk about stuff in a way I like to do it. So uh, you need to do both though, right? And like uh, if you really want to take it seriously, like the way Trung is, you know, you've left your job. You're not doing your own stuff. Like there's a reason for you to do it, right? Um, so I'm not against doing it. And I may be tweeting right after this 15 things I learned from Alex Cohen about startup <laughs> investing. So don't judge me then. But yeah, so that's kind of how I feel about it. It's more about like, I, I completely agree with you, the, the people who are just doing it for that sake and they're literally just copying each other. That shit so is really boring I'll, and annoying let, for sure. I'll let you in on a secret. I also want to say real quick. So like back to your point, Trump, there was a guy who's a fucking expert in like war vehicle tires and he yeah. posted all these threats. And I was like, this is amazing. Like you are learning. It's like unique knowledge that he can share. Completely. And that tweet thread's a great way to do that. But that is, but he's not in two months. Like, Hey, sign up for my fucking war truck tire course. And so Wait, his- we don't know yet. We don't know yet. Buddy. <laughs> <laughs> we hope not, but all right. So the, I learned this recently there. I, you've probably seen like the clickbaity guys, they post all these threads and they're like, Hey, I'm launching a course on how to grow your, your social following. 
the, the course is like literally how to write threads, but in the cohort of other people who have also paid for the course, your entire job is to pump each other's content. And so they're all like writing threads in a WhatsApp group, fucking saying, Hey, pump my shit, pump my shit. And so now you have a, like 10 new people writing inauthentic tweet threads, pumping each other's shit. And the guys who are selling the courses are also pumping the shit. And so it just, it's just like spiraled out of control. Yeah, it sounds like a big waste of time. It, it definitely <laughs> did. It definitely did get like, we can all agree that in the past six months, it has noticeably gone out of control. Yeah. Right? Like this is not yeah. us like imagining. It is like you open your Twitter feed and it is just, yeah. It is a the trending war, tweets. It is uh, awesome now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's gotten abused. Like the threads have gotten massively abused recently. It's so definitely is, no. This is this is what I want to bring up. Like I'll bring up one last point because dude, you work in tech, man. Your product, dude, is like so. LinkedIn had the same problem, right? Like five years ago, they were somebody hacked the system, and the system was there. This. Yeah, the you, the bro tree, right? And it's very simple. It's like. They the LinkedIn you algo was prioritizing if you click broetry. Yeah, broetry. Yeah. <laughs> so like bro, the word bro plus poetry. Like these dudes were writing single line, similar to what we're seeing now. Oh with yeah, yeah. The friends. single line stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> the single line like uh, hustle porn stuff. But like this was the thing. Like when you click on the read more button on LinkedIn, because when they show a post, right, it's it's cut off and then it says read more. LinkedIn was like overweighting when people click read more right and th these guys already clickbait headlines people hit read more they'll be like fuck i fucking clicked it uh, but, but they actually changed it the right linkedin yeah. actually changed it and they banned those guys they banned the guys who so right now twitter has this problem with threads and I am, listen, I am an offender. I have gone to 360,000 by being a thread guy. So I am not innocent here. But all I'm saying is this, it is within the power of LinkedIn <laughs> to look at these threads and, uh, of Twitter and do something about it. You're PM guy. What are you doing, Alex? You're seeing this issue, but you have to get engagement. What are you going to do? Deal with the devil. All right. I'm just, I'm just spitballing here. So okay. if, first thought that comes to mind you have an entirely new type of post that is, a, you recognize when someone's posted a thread, you let them post their threads, but you give every other Twitter follower the ability to fucking filter threads out of their timeline. Or downvote. They, they brought the downvote yeah. out. Downvote too. Like, oh, fuck, this was clickbaity. Downvote your content shitty. And maybe you get enough downvotes. You can't post a thread for like two weeks. That I would feel be like great. that stuff doesn't <laughs> work great because I, I often press like the three dots and like don't show me uh, tweets like this and I the next day I see the same person post the same thing and I'm like I, I'm pretty Dude, sure you I pressed it give, on this tweet like, give the algo some time man these guys aren't wizards they gotta I've been doing it for a year dude got, yeah come on bro no I think they need to treat a thread as its own thing and when you say don't show me tweets like this it's not don't show me tweets related to this content type or this subject type it is I don't want to see more fucking clickbait threads. Like that okay. should be the thing that happens in the background. In the but settings, like a big ass checkbox. Don't show me the clickbait <laughs> well, actually, things. Alex, to your point, they uh, they are floating uh, Twitter essays, right? Like, you know, people are just like, guys, yeah. listen. Yeah. It makes just, more sense. And, and if it's anything like Twitter spaces where everything's just going to the top, you know, people about to abuse Twitter essays, man. It's yeah. like, <laughs> you yeah, know, but at least I can choose not to read them. I choose not to listen to Twitter spaces. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough, man. Fair enough. All right. This people, you just received from Alex Cohen, some investing advice, some product advice, some health <laughs> no, advice no. Some, <laughs> across the board. What an episode, man. I did not expect this much advice being given in 75 minutes. <laughs> Alice, oh, man, our, our, on, our, mate. Legal, our legal team is about to uh, about to serve me a slap. <laughs> They're picking you right now. Yeah. <laughs> All right, boys. Well, dude, well, let anything me ask, else well, to? Uh, one more yeah, question go on, for Alex. Blah, blah, I know you got. Uh, if you got one more, no, right no, no, go me. for it, go for it. Okay, quick one is uh, dude. So Carbon Health, uh, you mentioned uh, the vice chairman uh, and also the CEO. So you guys actually have a reputation as being very pro shit posting, right? It's like, <laughs> no, yeah, this is true. It's like you, I mean key executives like yourself um are, are very visible on twitter having a good time tell me this is my question how lit is the carbon health slack channels <laughs> i mean is it incredible like give me a taste there so it's we definitely have workshops and stuff together i'll say that uh, 
we just, I don't know, man, people like, I would say the team at carbon has an amazing culture. Like people just like to have fun. They have a good sense of humor. I think that's what it comes down to at the end of the day. It's like shit posting. Is it just a way to describe, I think having a sense of humor on Twitter. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, when I, when I joined, that was the first thing I asked Aaron was like, how much do you want me to tone down my tweets? And he was like, don't like, don't tone down your tweets. If, if it becomes a problem, we'll address it. And the one I don't talk about healthcare. Like I just, I remove healthcare, like any sort of conflict of interest, like weird healthcare topics from my uh, that's a great persona. point. Um, and just like focus on the, the tech startup y like funny shit there. So you won't typically see me talk about COVID or like, you know, healthcare things. And like, we're working to solve all this stuff in the background, but I don't like to share it publicly. Um, but yeah, I mean, people, I mean, it's funny because like a lot of the team follows me on Twitter. So when I post a banger, they'll like bring it up during stand up and like make jokes. And I, I just think it's funny. I'm like, look, we're all, I don't know. Everyone needs a sense of humor. Like I hope we're having a good time and I'm doing my best not to like, you know, piss off an army of internet trolls and have them come find me in real life. But, uh, you know, so I think for the most part, it's like lighthearted humor. Same thing with Aaron. His tweets are very like lighthearted, humory shit posts. And that's just us having a fun time. Aaron's actually for the record roasted me a number of times on my threads. <laughs> I, I, so I will, actually, I, I wish I had time to pull this up, but uh, I'll tell the listeners, uh, we can put it in the telegram channel, but I wrote, I'll tell the one that really killed me. I wrote a thread about uh, Bernard Arnault, uh, the <laughs> third richest man in the world, founder or the, the LVMH guy. And the, that, <laughs> so who Jack Butcher calls old matey. The, yeah, the NIA Jack Butcher phrase. calls him old matey. So after I read this thread, certified banger, uh, Aaron Bally literally just <laughs> copies and pastes the, the text from Wikipedia and makes like the first five, like a five tweet thread. And it's just, a, it's just a text from Wikipedia, including all like the brackets. And, like, oh, that's the hilarious. Oh, dude, I was, I was in stitches. I'm like, that. I'm like, that's good, man. That's good. I deserve that. There you go. <laughs> oh man. Um, Aaron, Aaron has some really funny tweets. My favorite thing is, um, uh, like I, I give the, I give the team a boost. Like they post a good tweet. I retweet it and it goes viral. And I'm like, this is, this is fucking legit. This is having a good time. This is how, this, <laughs> this is why you need wrap, that WhatsApp my group. Part, right? That's it boys. <laughs> yeah, dude, that's why you need the WhatsApp group. Alex, don't hate on the WhatsApp group, bro. That's, that's I know it. apparently that we're basically just doing it, but for shit posts. hundred <laughs> percent. All right, boys, Alex, thanks for coming on, man. Anything else before we wrap up boys? No, we already said we we know where to send the viewers. We, if you want to laugh at another Cohen, I just know, hit Cohen, that Twitter thanks. handle. And if, send your pitch <laughs> decks in the DMs. It sounds like yes, yeah, send the pitch decks in the DMs, <laughs> dude. But read, make sure to read what he wants, right? Don't be sending him no marketplace. Don't send him an e-commerce marketplace. I'll, uh, I'll I'll leave you guys with one last thing before we jump. Someone once called my Twitter a reverse bullet. Basically, it's serious in the DMs and party in the front. <laughs> that's hilarious. <laughs> that, that's amazing. That is amazing. Is that the reverse David? Was it David Bowie? Is that, uh, is that the oh, opposite of him? <laughs> All right, boys. Thanks again for listening and joining us. We'll have uh, another episode for you next week. And we're actually coming up to one year, Trung. I don't know if you noticed. We're yeah, on we're, 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 episode 50. Well, we're going to make... Alice is going to do a yearly thing. We're going to find out his position on Bitcoin and Roblox every that's year it. when he comes back. <laughs> Thanks for coming on, Alex. Appreciate you, man. Yeah, thanks for coming, brother. All right, boys. Uh, Yeah, again, thanks again for joining us, and we'll see you on the next one.